The first macromolecule we're going to take a look at is carbohydrates, and its name sort of comes from hydrated carbon. It's a hydrocarbon skeleton, again, with a whole bunch of hydroxyl groups on the end. And in general, you can identify carbohydrates from their molecular formula, their recipe of atoms. They usually have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio when it comes to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So that 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, now when you link a whole bunch of monomers like glucose together in a polymer, that, that beaded chain type thing, uh, that will be a little bit different. You'll lose some things. We'll take a look at that in time. But essentially, again, 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So sort of this form is usually CnH2NON. And you just plug in the Ns for the number of carbons and oxygens, and away you go. So the carbohydrates are the most common organic molecules on Earth. They have various uses, which we'll get into in a little bit here. But they all tend to end in OS, so the O-S-E ending. And in general, we're going to classify them by their number of carbons as well. So if you had a three-carbon sugar, it would be a triose. A six-carbon sugar would be a hexose sugar, and so on and so forth. And we're also going to use the Greek root word saccharide, which means sugar, and we're also going to add in uh, the prefixes, so for mono, for a one sort of unit, a, a monomer of a sugar. If we have a few of them, that would be oligo. If we had two or three, it would be di or tri. Oligo is just generally a few, all the way up to many, a whole bunch, hundreds, thousands, and that would be a polysaccharide. The other thing we'll see with sugars is the, there's always a carbonyl group, or carbonyl group as the British like to pronounce it, and that'll mean we'll have aldose and keto sugars from aldehydes and ketones based on the location of that carbonyl group. So here we see two carbons, or sorry, two carbohydrates, and they've all got the same uh, molecular formula. These are all C6, if you take time to count them up and pause, it's C6H12O6. So, uh, typically, we usually refer to this as glucose, but you can see that glucose is an aldose because it's got that carbonyl group on the end of its molecule, whereas fructose, which is also C6H12O6, has its carbonyl group kind of in the middle someplace, in this case on carbon 2 instead of on carbon 1, and we'll talk about numbering carbons in the next slide, but that makes it a keto sugar. So when these things, they, you can see they obviously have very, very different structures, even though they have the same number of carbons, hydrogen, o carbon, carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and that makes them isomers. So molecules with the same molecular form, the same recipe, but they end up with different structures. Okay, so another concept we'll have to do with uh, carbohydrates, something that's important and, and becomes important first year university, college, and beyond is how you figure out the number of carbons. And the basic rule is if it's a straight chain like this one we have here, we start at the carbonyl group and then go down. So the carbonyl group here would be carbon number one. This would be carbon number two, three, four, five, and six. So it's pretty easy with um, straight chain carbons. It gets a little trickier when they become rings though. So when you take these straight chain sugars, these straight chain carbohydrates and throw them in water, you get rings and it's the carbonyl group that ends up giving you uh, the ring and it, and it sort of bends back around and it, this is a glucose molecule so they're both glucoses. This is sort of the anhydrous or dry form and this is the hydrated form. And you can just see that in ring forms we start at the oxygen in the ring and then we go clockwise. So carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And in organic chemistry you get a whole. You need to know and be able to tell people the location of things, and this will become important when we talk about how these monomer or monosaccharide type sugars join to form other sugars. Okay, so in terms of the uses of carbohydrates and what living things use them for, uh, they're the most common macromolecule that you're going to find in living things. Uh, they're also mainly used as an energy source, and every living thing has a metabolism, uh, some sort of cell respiration. They're all almost exactly the same based on the metabolism of glucose. Now that glucose may come from energy storage molecules like uh, starches. They're also going to help form cellular structures and then structures for organisms. That's going to be the example that we would see with, with cellulose and then something called chitin. And carbohydrate molecules are also going to stick out from the cell membrane of every cell 
and it's going to sort of provide an, an identification way of the cell to tell what cells belong where, what tissues and what cell types they are, and then what types of cells they are and where they come from. So your cells have a very specific set of carbohydrate structure on the outside as opposed to my cells and that allows our bodies to identify which cells belong there and which don't sort of a, a foreign detection agency to, so you can tell who belongs and who doesn't inside an organism. Now if you take the time to take a look at these two these three molecules here actually you're going to see that if you count them all up they're going to have uh, C6 H12, O6 is a molecular formula, even though they've all got slightly different structures, even though it may be as subtle as the difference, for example, between glucose and galactose here. Uh, they're all isomers, uh, glucose and galactose, they are both aldose sugars, so they end up having their aldehyde at the end, their aldehyde carbonyl group at the end. That makes them have very, very similar three-dimensional structures. And you can tell that they're almost indistinguishable, but fructose here is, is a keto sugar. So we'll just put A and K there to show you the difference. And you can see that the keto, keto structure with the carbonyl group in the middle sort of forms a much different three-dimensional molecule. Instead of being sort of hexagonal in nature, it's much more like a, a five-sided pentagon. And that means that it'll all three of these will undergo slightly different reactions inside cells. Now, all living things have metabolism that's based on glucose, and if you throw the other types in, they end up getting converted to these other things. Now, along with glucose, galactose, and fructose, there's two different types of glucose. As we see here, there's alpha glucose and beta glucose. And both talk about what's going on at the carbon number one position. The difference is that alpha glucose has a hydroxyl group pointing down, and beta glucose has it pointing up. That's the only difference between the two sugars. Everything else is the same. And really, it's a, a relic of sort of three-dimensional issues. Uh, in the others, if you were to build these three-dimensionally, in the carbon rings, the alpha glucose, the hydroxyls do go up and down, except for... Um, what's going on in carbon number one here. Carbon number one is pointing into or away from you. If you imagine it sort of flat on a sheet, so when you press it flat on a sheet, you've got to either pick whether it's coming out at you or away at you, and that gives us the two different isomers of glucose, alpha and beta glucose. They're not structural isomers like glucose, galactose, and fructose. They're what we would call optical isomers. So they're slightly different three-dimensionally in shape, but it's more like sort of a mirror image situation. And the difference here is going to be that alpha glucose linkages, if it's a polymer, so you put a whole bunch of alpha glucoses together, animals have enzymes that can break those individual glucose molecules apart, break, break those alpha glucose linkages with this hydroxyl group. Beta glucose linkages are accomplished much more by plants. That's how they store a lot of things in cellulose. And animals can't break those things down. There are bacteria that can break beta glucose linkages down, but not animals. And we'll talk about more about the significance of that later. Now, one of the big uses of carbohydrates is, is energy. Uh, you know, they do become part of cell structure or organism structure if it's a, you know, on the cell membrane or plant cell walls made of cellulose and then big structures made of cellulose like trees and branches and so on. But by and large, it's still a glucose polymer system. So in both of these, uh, starch and cellulose, you can see we've got slightly different three-dimensional shapes. We'll talk about that sh in a little while shortly. But uh, we've got glucose polymers all linked together. The, again, the polymer monomer concept. And we'll talk about how we link two glu glucoses together. And that'll be exactly the same if we were linking thousands of them together. Okay, so here we've got two glucose molecules. And we're going to form from two monosaccharides. We're going to form a disaccharide. So we're going to put these together, a, a two sugar molecule. And this will be the same as if we're forming three sugars together, a trisaccharide, if we're forming a bunch of them, sort of an oligo, or if we're forming by the hundreds or thousands in a polysaccharide. The reaction we're going to use to do this is called dehydration synthesis. Sometimes it's called condensation. I like dehydration synthesis because it lets you know that you're put, making something, so you're building something, synthesis, by dehydrating it, so taking out water. To do a dehydration synthesis reaction, we're simply going to take two hydroxyl groups on the carbons 1 and 4 of two glucose molecules and we're going, we're going to have an enzyme that will do this and it'll bring these two glucose molecules together kind of push and stress those bonds between the hydroxyl groups and I use this sort of rhyme that it's like, it's like playing cowboy they're going to lasso the hydroxyl groups, squeeze the water out and once they do that the water comes out, the oxygen is left behind 
and we have this oxygen bridge. So it's lasso the hydroxyl groups, squeeze the water out, right over the oxygen bridge into the sunset. And if you remember how we numbered our carbons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. We want to tell everybody where we binded, or bonded, sorry, um, joined these two monosaccharides together, and it's at carbon 1 and 4. So we call this a 1, 4, and the special name for this type of bond is a glycosidic linkage. So the bonds that hold all polysaccharides, or oligosaccharides, or disaccharides together, are glycosidic linkages, and the 1, 4 just tells us which hydroxyl groups we attach together. And this molecule we've just created, this disaccharide joined by two glucoses coming together, is called maltose. And you might sort of be familiar with the smell of maltose. Oftentimes it's sort of that a toasty bread sort of scent. It has that scent, and we use that uh, to make malted beverages. Um, and we can also sort of see what happens to that sometimes in, in certain situations. When we toast bread, it's that type of molecule. Now if we combine glucose with its isomers, we get uh, other disaccharides, and we're familiar with these names. If we take galactose and glucose together, we get lactose, and that's the sugar that's present in milk. Some people are lactose intolerant. They lack the enzyme that allows them to break this 1,4 glycosidic linkage between glucose and galactose. And you can see this is a, a, a galactose molecule formed from a beta. This is, be this is galactose and this is glucose. It's a beta-glucose molecule. It's got its O up there, and it's lactose. Now if we put glucose and fructose together, this is sucrose, this is table sugar, and these are pretty common disaccharides that you run into sort of in everyday life. Now these are the common polysaccharides we tend to see in living things, the four, cellulose, starch, glycogen, and chitin. Now out of these, cellulose and starch typically are produced by plants. There's different types of starch, um, but they're produced by plants. Glycogen and chitin uh, can be produced by animals. Chitin can also be produced by the fungi, and we'll leave it last because, as you can tell, uh, it's a little different with these nitrogen groups. Now, cellulose is a little different. Uh, the type of glucose that we're going to join when we do cellulose instead of alpha glucoses, we're going to use beta glucoses, and that means that we can't break this down. We tend to call it fiber when it's in our diet. Uh, it's the same stuff that's in paper, same stuff that makes up wood that frames your house or your apartment we can't break this stuff down. Now some animals can break it down, but they don't actually break it down. They harbor in sort of a symbiotic bacteria in their guts or extra pouches on their way to their stomach that allow them to break this down. Now the starches, there's different types of starches, but they're all alpha glucose polymers. Um, they tend to have large branching structures while the celluloses tend to be very flat and straight. Uh, the starches are energy storage type molecules. This is the type of thing you find in potatoes or corn. Um, sometimes it can be very, very sweet because there's different types of starches, but they tend to be branched. They got a large surface area. It's easy to break these individual glucose molecules off in them and end up getting individual sugars, glucose molecules you can throw into cell respiration. Glycogen is sort of something that's called animal starch. It's what animals store glucose as after it's been in the bloodstream as a storage molecule. It's sort of a medium-term storage. You'd find this in your liver. Now, chitin is very, very special. You can see it's got these nitrogen groups tacked on instead of a hydroxyl group where we normally see it in glucose. Chitin forms the cell wall in all fungi, and it's also present in animals. The place where we're going to tend to see chitin in animals is in the exoskeleton of a lot of invertebrates, uh, like the crab you see here or uh, a lot of arthropods, the insects, are going to have exoskeletons made of chitin. And in some cases, you can actually use that chitin, even though it's very hard and flat, which is why it's a lot like cellulose, because it's hard and flat and can sit. And you'll have some examples on a worksheet for this in class. But it gives it its strength. And those nitrogens act like those hydroxyl groups, forming hydrogen bonds between these strands or sheets of these types of things. You can actually take chitin sometimes from uh, shellfish like crab, and you can take them and you can regrind them, purify it, soften it, connect it in a slightly different way, and you can use it to make um, contact lenses. So some of you may actually be wearing little bits of chitin in your eyes as you watch this video. Uh, that about does it for the carbohydrates, and we'll move on later and talk about the lipids and amino acids slash proteins.